Several centuries before our era, travelers told of a valley deep and inaccessible, guarded by snakes and birds of prey, which contained fabulous diamonds. A powerful lord of that time sent his servant in search of the precious stones. To escape the dangers, they threw pieces of meat into the valley. Raptors rushed to retrieve the food in which diamonds were encrusted. The men needed only to plunder the nests and bring their bounty to their sovereign. Thus spread over the ages the legend of the Valley of Diamonds. Today, no one really knows where it's located. Maybe in the eastern region of Guinea, Benancoro, whose wealth in diamonds and hostility of nature recalls the tale. This is an exceptional and uh, deflawless heart shape. Here is an exceptional piece. A diamond necklace, perfectly pure, heart and pear-shaped. It's more than 128 carats and it's mounted on platinum. And it's very flexible. It's beautiful. It's very flexible, easy to wear. The African continent is a major producer of diamonds. On its western coast, Conakry, Guinea, produces exceptional gems. In 1955, Sekou Touré became mayor of Conakry, then president of this country that now houses 7 million inhabitants. He remained in power for 27 years. Guineans have forgotten his image as a tyrant because he was able to impose the name of the country worldwide. There are three dominant ethnic groups, the Fulani, the Malinke, and the Susus. They are very involved in diamond mining, located mainly in their stronghold in Upper Guinea on the boundary of the Guinea forest. The diamond reserve is estimated at 25 million carats. Large quantities of gold, iron, aluminum, and uranium are also part of the natural resources of this country. The production of diamonds in Guinea is mainly artisanal, despite some industrial companies that have, in 2001, produced 25,000 carats. Artisans have unearthed 338,000, or 14 times more. Fatou is a woman master, mastar on her concession, which means she is the owner. It is she who will have first choice of the diamonds that the workers find here. The griots, sorts of tubadours, sing the boss's praises in exchange for some bills. To reach the diamond-rich land covered by alluvia, miners dig dozens of meters deep. One of the largest diamond reserves in the world for jewelry is in this extremely closed-off region, near a town called Banancoro. In 1932, the first diamond was officially discovered by an Irish prospector, Dermody, in the headwaters of the Makona River in the forest region of Guinea. What do we find here? We find diamonds. The XX diamond. Blue eyes. Is it good quality here? Good quality, good quality. You often find it in your parcel? Yes, often, often. We chose the right God. What is a master? A master is someone who buys diamonds that come out of there. 
Okay. The master, he buys the diamonds. Yes, I buy the diamonds. I buy them from the workers. Yes, and after you sell them to whom? We sell them to a collector. That's it. Then the collector, what does he do with the diamond afterwards? He goes to the trading post. The search is artisanal. All is done with the arms, a shovel, a sieve, and their feet in water all day. This zone is under heavy military surveillance. It is very close to Liberia and Sierra Leone, two countries of great political unrest. Guerrilla troops do not hesitate to cross the borders into Guinea. In the 1950s, underground operators from Sierra Leone invaded the area. Many stayed. Others followed later, fleeing civil war in their country. Fatou is happy to find a stone in the very first cleaning of the day. People are very superstitious here. This discovery, even if the diamond is not very big, is going to bring her luck on her concession. It's like a lottery. You can find lots of stones and become very rich, or lose all your money in an unnecessary work in a sterile mine. The criteria for quality of a diamond, like purity and color, are precisely determined. The weight is also. The unit of measurement is 0.2 grams per carat. The name comes from the carob seed, once used in the East, whose weight was always constant. The Benancoro area is populated by Kurankos, an ethnic subgroup of the Malenka. They're Islamic fundamentalists. The city has hundreds of mosques, Hotels, considered places of debauchery, do not exist, and public schools are located outside the city. There is no running water, no electricity, no telephones, and this in the place that every day encounters the most precious and expensive material on earth. The military is omnipresent on the mines and throughout the region. They are quick to say they're in a war zone. Diamond attracts the envy of all the nearest neighbors. Several times a week, Fatou buys the stones directly on the mine. Her right-hand man has recovered every stone found on the concession. Workers gather to discuss the price with Fatou. She has the indisputable priority of purchase. Any breach of this right would be severely punished as theft in this region. If she does not buy the stone, which is extremely rare, the miner may sell elsewhere. The workers, like their employers, know the approximate price of stones, but they have no gemological training, which sometimes gives rise to heated discussions. Five carat, 75, eh? You saw what I saw. There's a little dive and a cut, eh? Two million. Three million is too much, you know. It's not cut. There's a small dive in the corner. Two million five hundred. No, no, that's too much. Two million three hundred. Okay. Okay, that's paid for. How much is that? Two carats, 48. Quick, quick. One million four hundred. One million four hundred, too much. Seven hundred thousand. Seven hundred thousand is small. No, it's not small. Eight hundred thousand. No, nine hundred. Eight hundred and fifty. Okay. Okay. Transactions here are made in Guinean francs. A euro is equivalent to slightly less than two thousand Guinean francs. It's you who'll eat all the money again. We've worked hard here. You worked hard, but all the money you're going to eat it. 
Tomorrow, a lot of washing. We will win a lot. Please, God. Often, the money recovered by miners during the sale of a stone only allows them to repay the debts they have contracted with various businesses in Benancoro. The boss supports some of the miners' needs, including food. Weekly ration of rice is distributed to workers once a week. It is often their only means of subsistence. If an important stone is found, the allocation is divided equally between the miner and the boss when the stone is sold. The boss will deduct the full cost incurred for the employee. I am the Secretary General of the Diamond Trade Association of Guinea. The Diamond Trade Association aims to bring together all persons interested in the diamond. The state has a major role. It is to provide plots to those who want to work for those who want to invest in artisanal mining. The region is extremely rich in diamonds. There is an almost incalculable amount because the amount of diamonds amounts to millions and millions of carats. Last year, we sold 78,000 carats in the whole area, which takes some 300,000 miners. In 1999, we found a 747 carat stone in Dembaya. In 1995, a private diamond operator was lying in his hammock. He was out there dreaming. His children came crying, Dad, Dad, someone's found something, someone's coming from Faro. And he told his children, get the hell out. And the children said, but it's the military who've come. And he said, oh, they must have come to arrest me. He didn't know it, but they were coming because of a 285 carat stone that had been found on his plot. And when they came to give it to him, it's me who took the stone on behalf of the association, and I brought it back to the director. That was in 1995. The richest concessions are in the Bomboko River area, which is a tributary of the Baul River. This river has carried alluvial streams rich with diamonds for thousands of years. A diamond is composed of pure crystallized carbon. This carbon is common throughout the earth, but to make a diamond, one must bring its atoms extremely close together. Otherwise, you obtain graphite. Despite strong pressure from 45,000 to 60,000 atmospheres, the atoms are recalcitrant. They come together only when the pressure is added to high temperatures, between 900 and 1300 degrees centigrade. These conditions are made only at depths of 150 to 200 kilometers under the Earth's crust at the base of the lithospheric roots. When the diamonds crystallize, they must rise to the surface of the earth. Like an elevator, a rock called kimberlite is responsible for these precious passengers making their way to the surface. They form a dike that explodes in a volcanic eruption. Then the volcano dies down and erosion begins. It will provide alluvial deposits. Diamond is very old. It was brought to the surface of the earth 100 million to a billion years ago, depending on the region. Kimberlite, which has remained frozen in the conduit of the volcano, called the pipe, is the primary deposit of diamonds. To obtain only a few carats, 
several thousand tons must be moved. Highly concentrated areas of alluvial diamonds are more easily exploitable in an artisanal manner. The alluvial soil, rich in gems, is transported to a wash area. The earth is put into an extremely thin mesh sieve and then washed. The gravel, rolled by the rivers and containing diamonds, gets stuck in the sieve. The miner's expert eye can immediately remove the large stones which have no value. On this operation, the owner is represented by an official who monitors the discovery of each stone. The rotary movement imposed on the screen concentrates the heavy minerals in the center of the sieve, which includes diamonds. Also included are garnet, ilmenite, and olivine. These heavy minerals are regarded as indicators that the gemstone is nearby. Diamonds may be turned into the boss or his representative, who will keep them in an envelope, a folded piece of paper with the name of the finder in order to discuss the price with him later. Once the washing and water is completed, the contents of the sieve are placed on a flat surface to be carefully sorted, under the inquisitive eyes of the officer. The larger stones are usually released before this step. The important refraction of diamonds distinguishes these small stones from the duller gravel. <laughs> A final sifting of the gravel by hand indicates the end of this meticulous search. Also used on the mines are mechanical sieves, whose principle is the same as the manual screening, but which can handle larger masses of ore. When a master has not found a single diamond on his concession for some time, the tension rises, and he is eager to see the result of the screening. This is understandable because in the trade of precious stones, the most random factor is always the mining. Many people have been ruined this way. There is a real suspicion between the diamond dealers in this country. Here, we do not lend stones, even among the mosses because everyone thinks that an exchange with a stone of lesser value is possible. One day, a master beat one of his miners, thinking he had stolen large stones. The miner died, but the stones were never found, and the overseer was finally hanged. Finding a diamond restores confidence in the future, and the smiles return.
Andre has bought a franchise. He must equip the miners who will go work for him. Then, as tradition dictates, he must seek help from a marabou. Here, the diamond was used before by our ancestors. From what we were told, it was used for the king's wives' necklaces, to make necklaces. People did not know the value of the stone, which is why as soon as someone found a couple like that, they would take them directly to the chief, and in exchange were given enough to live off of. There are older ones in this country, Kuranko, for example. If you're very unhappy, but if you respect him and give him everything he needs to be rewarded, if he really wants to help you, he tells you, okay, I would like to help as you are so respectful and so wise about what you do. I cannot pay you the reward that you came to seek. It is the diamond, and I'm not God, but I'll help you find it. He brings you, he has a small cane that he plants, and tells you where to dig. You dig, and you immediately find the minimum of what you want, the minimum to meet your needs. And he just says, my son, what you have found is a reward for everything you did well for me. But when he removes the stick, you cannot find anything. It is as though he is the one who has hidden the stones. Andre brings the marabou five red kola nuts, symbolizing hospitality, five white kola nuts for happiness, and a red cock for sacrifice. Despite the Muslim religion, animist customs have remained very present in this region. Some do not hesitate to discuss the practice of human sacrifice to attract diamonds. Small collectors buy the stones from miners whose owners did not want them. Sometimes they can also be illegally found stones, smuggled or stolen. But in all cases, they are small stones. How much? 80. 40,000 is good? No, that's too much. Barry is a collector. He takes few risks. He buys diamonds from miners and from masters. He never invests money in the mines. He will be the intermediary that sells the stones to counters in Conakry. 18 million Guinean francs. 3,800,000 Guinean francs. Tell me your last price. 17 million five. 4 million, good. 17 million five? 4 million is good? 6 carat 30 times 5 carat 65 times. Okay, 5 million francs guinea. Is 5 million good? 5 million guinea in francs. 5 million. What is your last price? 5 million. No, 8 million francs. No, my last price is 5 million. 
Okay? Is that good? It's good. It's not good. Okay. No, it's not good. So we do not agree? Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. There are not only colorless diamonds in Guinea. Some stones can be yellow, sometimes blue. If the color is pure and pleasing to the eye, that makes the price of the stone go up. A yellow stone. How much do you want? It's very yellow. One million. No, that's no good. One million five hundred. Maximum. No, three million five hundred. Two million five hundred. Okay, two million. Okay, two million seven hundred. Okay, two million eight hundred thousand. Okay, the value of the stones, good price, eh? Here in Banakoro, business is interrupted by the five daily prayers that no one misses. It takes two days by car for collectors from Banankoro to travel to Konakri. Curiously, the diamond market is relatively well-structured in Guinea. The diamond merchants must pay a fee to be licensed by the state, which pays a supervisory role. But from the mine to the counters, at each stage, a number of stones go through unofficial circuits to avoid taxes. Some large Guinean diamond merchants have their counters directly in their homes. This is for safety reasons, because the capital is not safe, especially at night. They bring the stones from Banankoro and they buy because they are already registered. These are their cards. That is the law in Guinea. As soon as someone comes that does not have papers, they cannot do the job. How much is it? In all? A hundred thousand. It's not the best. A total of 120 carats. A hundred thousand dollars. Yes, it's too much. We can leave it at forty-five thousand dollars there. Is that good? No, that's not good. Ninety thousand dollars. No, that's too much. You must reduce it. Let it go for forty-six thousand. No, that's no good. 50,000 okay? 50,000? No, 80,000 dollars. That's too much. Go down. How much will you leave it for? What's your last price? 70,000 dollars. That's too much. Below 60,000. Less than 60,000 is how much? The diamond market and its prices are known worldwide. It is always possible to make a deal. But in general, the various actors in the market are well aware of the prices, give or take a small percentage. I told you below 60. No, below 70. No, but please. 
Okay, bring it. Okay, to 58,000. No, it needs to be 55. Or 54. <laughs> Okay, uh, give me back my stones. No, give it. Okay, 55. Okay, okay, 55. <laughs> The margins made by traders of rust stones are relatively small, but they represent significant sums given the volume traded. Few Westerners are included in this chain of diamond trading in Guinea. Some, like Gabriel de Toledo, who have been in this region a long time, are well established. My job is diamond dealer. I've been a diamond dealer for 42 years, and uh, I'm here in Africa. It's more adventurous than, say, to uh, stay in Europe. C'est plus aventureux que, disons, de rester en, en Europe. Je fais ça depuis... I've been doing this for years, and I'm known because, first of all, my word is my word. And uh, they also call me Mr. Cash, because what I buy is paid in cash. This is one of the principles in this profession, in purchases. I'm serious. I give prices that are close to the prices of Antwerp, with a very small profit margin. Um, that's what makes that I have so many customers. C'est ça qui fait que j'ai beaucoup de clients. 99% of diamonds are usual diamonds, but there are always stones that are unusual, and uh, that's what we seek. These are unusual the stones that make you very happy. It's not a matter of money, it's a question of fascination. I bought a beautiful 57 carat diamond, pure diamond, blue white, for a large sum. It had a heart shape. It was a fascinating diamond. It's a drug to be able to buy diamonds. It's a drug. I think I'll do it my whole life. Buying diamonds is not simple. However, it is less problematic than for other colored gemstones such as sapphires, rubies, and emeralds. The price is less subjective. The quality of the diamond is extremely well defined in terms of impurities it may contain, color and size. De Beers has ranked diamonds in 14,000 categories called price points. The stones are passed through screens to make lots of graded sizes, and to quickly estimate the overall price. The price has gone up, too. I know it's risen, but you doubly exaggerate. You must reduce the price, then. I cannot make an offer. We must reduce the price. It's not for me, then. More than 28 is not for me. Try to make the calculations. Here is the machine. Redo your calculations. Fake stones are very rarely presented at the counters because the rough diamond is difficult to imitate with other materials. Synthetic diamonds are extremely expensive to manufacture. And finally, the trading world is very closed. A counterfeiter would immediately be rejected. You've not gone down far enough. You're in too far. I want to show him the 35. 35, I say, sir. I thought you were showing me a price. I was amazed, a serious price for once. 
I would add another dollar, but after that it's over. The usual technique for sellers to overvalue their diamonds is to mix in different grades of stones in a large lot that they offer at the highest selling price. We'll weigh it and see how much it is. The price of diamonds is the price per carat. There is a 214.60 times 30, 6,438, 6,450 US dollars. You're amazed at the price. I gave you a good price. No, no, it's finished. I will not ask any more, otherwise it's not for me. The price of industrial diamonds is from 40 to 1,000 times less expensive than the jewel diamond and sometimes much more for pieces of exceptional quality. Industrial diamonds are ground into powder and used as an abrasive. A few decades ago, all colored diamonds were destined to this sad fate. It's 6,438. I'll give you 6,500 and we end the deal. 6,500, okay. You want Guinean francs or you want dollars? I want Guinean francs. Guinean francs. Give 13 million, Paco. 13 million. <laughs> when he has a stone that is a little bit more important, Gabriel tests its fluorescence. Indeed, a cut diamond has a lower value if its fluorescence is high, because in natural light it gives the impression of having a color higher quality than it actually has. Gabriel collects stones for regular shipments to Europe. Before sending abroad, officials from the counters must bring their stones to the Office of Natural Expertise in order to pay an export tax of 3% to the state of Guinea. The officials in this office assess the stones according to the international price of diamonds, which is updated periodically based on information provided by the International Diamond Council. This office of expertise also organizes regular auctions at which they sell diamonds from some industrial operations, like those of the Arador Company. Once the expertise is completed and the fee paid, the stones are transported to the airport by a security van and a sealed packet. The responsibility of the Office of Expertise stops at the foot of the aircraft. The main export destinations are mainly Antwerp, but also New York, Tel Aviv and London. Antwerp is one of the world's major diamond markets, 
It is difficult to precisely date the first cut diamonds in history. These are certainly Indian diamonds, which reached Europe in the first century AD. Stone cutters practice the technique of cutting by wearing the stone and obtaining small stones with irregular facets. Tell me how much you want for the stone. 30,000. 30,000 a carat? Give me a final price. Yes, yes. No, no. Payable today. It's at the end of the 15th and 16th centuries that in Bruges or Antwerp, enormous quantities of Indian diamonds came to be cut. Entire neighborhoods of Antwerp became specialized in diamond cutting. It became the largest economic center for diamonds in Europe. After a wave of immigration due to the religious intolerance of the Inquisition and the vagaries of history, starting in the 19th century, Antwerp has taken back its place. Guinean counters have an office in this city. I started in the diamond trade as a cleaver, that is to say the engineer of the rough diamond crystal, to analyze the material. Cleaving is a profession that's become extinct. And then I decided I don't want to become a diamond trader like there are all around the world. And I threw out the word that anywhere in the world that there was a colored diamond, obviously naturally colored, I'd be there within 24 hours with money. And if it was good, I'd buy it, and if not, I'd continue. So I started collecting, and I continued to sell the more important stones. And as I found that the one-carat stones were relatively shabby, I started the Rainbow Collection, a collection with a weight that is more or less one carat for each stone. If you want, I'll show you what this rainbow collection looks like. Twenty rows of 15 diamonds of color. So it is 300 colored diamonds with a total weight exceeding 300 carats. I continue to make the collection grow because in my lifetime I see no limits. I set it to 300 because I found that it was a figure that was fair. These diamonds that are already exceptional react to UV light dramatically. They look like little lamps lit in color. If we could, if we'll turn out the light, I'll show you what happens. The collection begins to flicker in the ultraviolet color. What you see now is not at all the color you see in the light of day. The rainbow collection is unique worldwide, and the three diamonds that Eddie Elsis owns are the rarest gems on our planet. There are only 11 such stones known. The identity of each stone is defined by four criteria of quality, the four C's. Carat, for weight, clarity, color, and cut. To cut a diamond, one must first cut the natural crystal with a laser, or even with a ground-off blade, to a precise weak location on the rock, the cleavage. Then, the optimal size is determined by a computer. This is a stone from here is a stone that's 14 carats 82. Now we'll measure this with the computer to see what weight we can get. Here it measures the stone. For now it takes geometric measurements. It does not weigh the diamond. It does some calculations. It's finished the first part of the job. It's measured the rough stone and it tells me its weight. 7.77 carats. Now we'll ask it to model the diamond, what form it should take. Oval, marquise, pear, or heart-shaped. We can ask what we want. Now, this model is perfect for a round stone. Apparently, this model is perfect for a round cut, so we'll take it as a basic round shape into the program. Now we're starting to project the diamond in the rough stone, and we can see what is the best use to make of it. Which stone he can best recover. It indicates the weight here, 4.22 carats. That's what we would draw from this stone. We can turn the stone to see if there's enough space all around the stone. If it leaves enough space here on the on the outside of the stone, of the rough stone. This is perfect. If there's nothing beyond the raw stone, we'll know it'll be good. 
we know we'll get a 4.22 carat diamond. The brilliant cut was probably cut in Italy in the early 17th century in Venice. The first step would have been rubbing two diamonds against each other to give the stone its general shape. They proceed to faceting it on a wheel covered with diamond powder from industrial diamonds that can be cut only by itself, as it is the hardest material. It is 140 times harder than sapphires or rubies. The Greeks called it Adam, which means the unconquerable. The stonecutter will carve the 57 or 58 brilliant cut facets, respecting each angle so that the light is reflected in the stone like in a multitude of mirrors. We protect the already cut parts of the diamond with molten borax because the high temperatures of cutting will dull its facets. One must take particular care of a diamond in the vicinity of a weld. A brilliant one carat diamond is usually obtained from a 2.5 carat stone. London sees 60% of the world's rough diamonds behind the walls of famous De Beers, which, for a near century, has imposed a monopoly on the diamond. My name is Leslie Coldham, and I am the Corporate Affairs Manager uh, of... My name is Leslie Coldham. I am the Director of the Centre for Information on Diamonds at the Diamond Trading Company in London. De Beers is the largest mining company in the world, and the oldest, too. De Beers was founded in 1888 by Kimberley, at the time when they discovered the first diamond-producing areas in South Africa. We can say that the creation of De Beers was the beginning of the diamond industry. The diamonds that we extract from our mines in South Africa represent 41 to 42 percent of the world's production. Last year, for example, we produced the equivalent of $3.2 billion. De Beers prospects across the world to find new deposits, particularly in Conakry, Guinea. Since 1995, We've been prospecting in southeastern Guinea since 1995. That is to say, we take samples from rivers at intervals of 20 to 25 kilometers. In these rivers, we look for minerals that indicate the presence of the rock, kimberlite, in which diamonds are sometimes found. These minerals principally comprise garnets. The kimberlite mostly contains garnets, these red stones, and black stones, also called ilmenite. From the results of sampling. Thanks to sampling and geophysical studies, we've identified a number of positive areas in southeastern Guinea, between the towns of Macenta and Karawan. These stones were formed billions of years ago and are a rarity, of course. But historically, men have always tried to recreate the diamond. As you know, we make artificial diamonds in factories. They make what we call industrial quality diamonds. And it seems incredible, but the artificial diamonds are actually more expensive than the natural diamonds. Some diamonds in Namibia are not on the beaches, but at the bottom of the sea. And De Beers has extractor vessels through which they can dig the seabed up to 120 meters in depth. De Beers has been very lucky because some of the world's finest diamonds have come from its mines. In particular, the premier mine in South Africa. A few years ago, we found a diamond that we called the De Beers Centenary Diamond. When it was discovered, it weighed 599 carats, a huge white diamond, perfect purity. So my name is Pascal Mouad. My name is Pascal Mouad, and I belong to the fourth generation of a family of jewelers who've been exercising since 1890, i.e., uh, my family has 110 been years. Very large my family has distinguished diamonds. itself by acquiring a very large amount of diamonds, including eight of historic significance, the Jubilee, including the Jubilee, Ahmedabad, the Ahmedabad, the, the Prime Rose, Rose the, Taylor the Taylor Burton, and, and some which bear our name, like the Mawad monolith, monolith, the Mawad Splendor, Splendor which are perfectly carats. pure diamonds of over 100 carats. Do you have anything with hearts? Because I really like hearts. Yes, I have a beautiful river in which all the diamonds are heart-shaped.
So if you're looking for something... If you're looking for something to match your necklace, we have a beautiful evening bag. Evening necklace, I have a beautiful diamond evening bag. And a total of 500 carats of white diamonds. The center stone, the center stone of which is 5.02 carats. VVS of 2, plus 7 carats of pink diamonds and 11 of yellow diamonds. If the diamond is eternal, then the follies that men engage in for it are as well. 